does Bezos sit back and say, man, I've made it? <laughs> or right. is he continuing to build new things? He and right the team that he's built. And then back to what Karen said earlier, let's add in Blue Origin and space and write right. all of these, again, big ideas and long-term thinking. And he's always looking at how to test, build, accelerate. Yeah. Over 1,700 new millionaires are created every single day in the U.S. alone, and more than double that across the globe. There are people from all walks of life, most of them people just like you and I. So the big question is this, how are so many people who didn't inherit money or have any special advantages overcoming the odds and becoming millionaires? That's the question, and this show will give you the answers. My name is Jeff Lerner, and welcome to Millionaire Secrets. All right, and welcome to another episode of Millionaire Secrets. Uh, we are in the virtual studio today with Steve and Karen Anderson, who I'm really excited to speak with because they are experts on a subject that I am simply a dilettante on, but I would call myself a massively influenced dilettante because it's such a fascinating subject, and that is the subject of the wisdom of Jeff Bezos, the, I think I'm right to say the richest guy in the world. Bill, yes. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and, and, and they're experts on many other things as well. But uh, that's the one that grabbed my attention based on the initial referral. Anyway, so we're going to get into all that great stuff, and we're going to talk about what it's like to work together as a husband and wife. So, Steve and Karen, welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Thanks. It's really good to be here. Good. Good Thanks. to hear. Yeah, yeah. Of course. So, uh, right out of the gate, let me set a little context for everyone. We are, um, you guys are, are having a roll with the punches moment, which as entrepreneurs and do it ourselves we, we have to get pretty darn good at. So you had a power outage, you had to migrate last minute over to Steve's office, and now you're kind of clumped together in an office sharing a mic, and we're just going to make it happen, right? That's right. You got to flex. Yeah, totally be, be flexible. So that, that's, what you, that's, what, uh, that's what you do as, as entrepreneurs. And um, in, term, in the context of Jeff Bezos, I guess you would just call it a, what, what a, a, a successful failure or something? Well, you know, we'll see by the end of the show if it's successful, but I, I yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I tell you, I mean, you know, neither you guys nor myself are, are part of a, it's not a small group of people that are influenced and, and perhaps even slightly enamored with Jeff Bezos. Like I, I'll admit, I, I study the guy, I study him, I study Elon Musk, I study Steve Jobs. You know, I just like people that, are, that think, uh, that first and foremost, they think disruptively large and then they don't actually get too scared to follow through. It's like they have big thoughts and then they're like, well, you know, I can't unthink the thought, so now it, I guess I need to do the action that, that stems from the thought, right? So I, I like guys like that. Um, they inspire me. But uh, and clearly you too. But I want to back up. Like you guys literally wrote the book on on the wisdom of Jeff Bezos, the Bezos Letters, which I will admit I have ordered a copy of. Uh, at first I got it on audiobook, and then I'm like, you know what? This is actually one I want to read, but I don't have it yet. And I frankly should have, but I think that that's probably a COVID thing. <laughs> Yeah. Not to not to like date stamp this episode or anything, but we are uh, you know, mid COVID crisis here, which is uh, maybe you guys have some insight too. I mean, if there's one guy that's been both impacted and impacted back the COVID thing, it's Jeff Bezos, right? I mean, he's he's Absolutely. the reason that half of us have toilet paper. So <laughs> um, anyway, let's back up though. How did you guys get into this this particular subject? Well, I'll take that one. Um... My background's in insurance, and uh, for the last 20 years, I have worked with helping insurance agents and brokers understand new and emerging technology 
you know, starting literally in the early 2000s. So lots of change, be it websites or, um, you know, databases or social platforms, right? All those kinds of things. And that in that work, uh, I came to the realization a few years ago that because technology was changing so rapidly, the biggest risk businesses face today is actually not taking enough risk, which is counterintuitive coming out of the insurance business because my career was focused on helping people, you know, minimize, mitigate, buy insurance policies to reduce the exposure to financial loss. And this is not an insurance thing, it's a risk management thing. So I began studying businesses that had done well, meaning taken risks and been able to grow, and those that hadn't. I uh, came across Amazon as a very innovative company uh, and actually continues to be very innovative. Uh, and then the, the shareholder letters and realized uh, it, from my view that uh, Jeff Bezos had hidden in plain sight his secrets, what I came up with, what we came up with as principles, of how we grew Amazon that I think apply to any business of uh, literally any size. Okay, now you want the girl version? <laughs> I totally do, yes, and I love that both are available to me. <laughs> so I've been in the book world most of my adult life, I think, and and I love the power of a book. I'm a book publisher, book ghostwriter, books are my world. And Steve originally was looking at doing a book on risk, and. Uh, the risk dilemma. Risk dilemma. How to know if you're taking enough risk or too much. Um, you know, you just don't know. And so it was a book on risk. And quite frankly, um, it was really boring. It was excruciatingly boring. It was so, so boring. And so, um, so one of the things that as he was doing his research, he came across these letters that, that the share um, owner letters that Bezos had written. And he came home and he was like, you know what? I just an interesting white paper. Like maybe I could just give it away as a white paper because he kind of talks about how he grew Amazon. And I had one of those moments when I went, oh my gosh, honey, that is not a white paper. That's your book. Hmm. And so part of it was understanding that Steve was really good at looking at, at things through the lens of risk. And as far as we knew, we hadn't had anybody look at how Bezos had grown Amazon before and using that lens. And so he was able to take them and um, extrapolate principles of how Bezos grew Amazon so that other people could learn from sort of his mistakes. Yeah. His successes and his mistakes. So that's the girl version. Well, I love it. It, so it sounds like together it's the right version. You know, it's, it, I, I hear a definite case of a male brain doing its thing and a female brain doing its thing and, and uh, the, the beauties in the pairing, right? It sounds a lot yeah. like me and my wife trying to figure out, I don't know, what, what car to get our son or something. I'm like, I'm like over there doing all the research and she's like going with her intuition, you know, but like, but what really fits him, mm -hmm. you right. know? And, and okay, so that's awesome. Um, I actually think a, a, The Risk Dilemma sounded like a pretty cool book, but I'm also... A pretty big nerd, so um, Good that we, we might be looking at that one as a second one. So, <laughs> um, but you know, actually, so so what can uh, I'm, here's the thing: I'm trying not to immediately jump into like, you know, I I, I haven't been able to get Jeff Bezos on the show, yeah. and frankly, that may be a while. Yeah. Um, so I'm like, I'm like, well, this is who needs Jeff, man? I've got the I've got Jeff's experts right uh or the experts on jeff so I'm, I'm trying to resist the temptation to just jump into all of the meat of amazon and how he did it and what he did and why it worked and wh what he did right and what he did wrong um well, do you mind if i help you out yeah yeah no please i'd love that because i think um part of what happened in the process of pulling the the book together uh, is kind of an example, an illustration of what you were talking about, which is, you know, Steve looks at things one way and I look at things another. And, and we'll be, if we make it to August, we'll be married 45 years. So we've been together a really long time. And awesome. 
I would say we can finish each other's sentences, but it's more I finish his sentences. So, um, but you know, part of what happened, and this is really, I think, what you're talking about in terms of thinking. When when Steve found the shareholder letters, part of what he did was an exhaustive analysis, but he did it in a very sort of linear way. He looked at the letter, and the first letter that everybody looks at is the 97 letter. That's the letter that Bezos sort of prefaces everything um, on and about. It goes back to that 97 letter. So Steve did an analysis of the 97 letter, and then he did an analysis of the 98 letter, and then he did an analysis of the 99 letter, and there are 20... Uh, well, the, the 21, 21. yeah. yeah mm -hmm. 20 letters. And he did a great analysis. Part of what I really respected about Steve and, and what we were able to do together was to look at, it felt like that that was not the right order to present the information because it wasn't, it wasn't approachable for people. So now I'll give you the guy version. <laughs> Actually, the conversation was, honey, I need to talk to you. And um, I don't know about you, but for me and most husbands I know, that's never a good preface to a conversation. And so I had worked on, I mean, months probably, worked on 97, she's right, 97, 98, 99, you know, 2000, what was said in it, what are the key takeaways, all of that kind of stuff that I had, I had looked at. And she said, honey, nobody cares what he said in 97 or 98 or 99. We, we need to have stories and we need, can you come up, and it, there was a conversation around this, but she said, can you come up with principles? And I, I was deflated at that point because I'd worked a long time putting this together. And part of, I think, why we can do this together is I trust her opinion implicitly. If she said the chronological didn't work, it didn't work. So then once I kind of got over that hurdle, it was like, OK, what, what are some principles here? And it, it took a few days to get that first initial list, um, which wasn't 14, but we ended up with 14. But yeah, it was actually at that point pretty easy to, to categorize or, or group the lessons into principles. And then from there, we took those principles and put them into cycles. And I think that framework is what really, one, resonates with people, and two, gives people a kind of a, again, a framework to, to think about how to apply those principles, because 14 is a lot. But the four cycles, test, build, accelerate, and scale, every business goes through, every product in a business, every department in a business are always going through those cycles and, and can apply the principles in a, a myriad of different ways. So, you know, I never know which direction these conversations are going to go. I'm not a, I'm not a part. First of all, I'm not a podcaster. I'm a business owner who likes to talk to people and I decided why not record it, right? Um, so I never know how these are going to go and I don't follow a script or a template, but I, I feel like totally selfishly, by the way, I have an opportunity to actually talk about my business, which is probably totally against what you're supposed to do on a podcast to talk about your own stuff and, and bounce some things off you guys and because you guys understand your framework a million times better than I do. I haven't read the book. I would love to get perhaps some analysis from you guys because you're, you're saying these are generally applicable principles to, gr to growing and scaling a business, right? Um, and I think it might be, you know, my audience actually knows my business reasonably well. Most of the people in my audience, they've followed me on social. They've heard me talk about the business models and do, I do, they know what I offer. They know that I'm scaling. Um, so it could be actually really useful for you to talk about. It was test, build, accelerate, scale. and scale, scale. right? Um, and it's interesting. So, so let me kind of set that up and be like, I think that would be fascinating and probably really valuable. Um, but also, you mentioned that you approached it linear at first and that Karen said, well, it's, it doesn't work, you know, back to front, I guess that would be. But it wasn't to say, oh, we'll flip it and go front to back. It was more, let's find the through lines mm -hmm. and, and, and then it'll always be relevant in any time, right? Uh, and which, you know, woman's intuition, I, I can't argue with that <laughs> for sure. But I will say, 
the letter that's always because I've I've read some of the shareholder letters before, and I've read articles about them. Like I said, I'm I'm kind of a dilettante on this subject. The thing that's always blown me away about Jeff Bezos is actually rooted in his very first letter, uh -huh. which is this guy. I mean, people call Warren Buffett an oracle. This guy like almost really seemed to see the future. And he said it in that first letter. He was like, guys, and, and I, th I think about the time, it was 1997, right? They were in the middle of, a, of the dot-com bubble expansion. And he came straight out and said, like, I'm not here to please the street. Right. I'm not playing your game. I'm thinking 20 years plus while you guys are all trying to make earnings. And he was, he was unapologetic about it. And well, I forget what the letter, you know, do, do they have names? I don't remember. I just remember that was the letter where he basically said like, I am an unapologetically long-term thinker, yes. even longer than you actually think long-term is as I'm saying this. Well, and let me give you an example. In the 97 letter, he really sets that up as his vision for Amazon and what's gonna happen. And, and one part of that, he says, we are building something great, something we can tell our grandchildren about. And, and so to me, that captured my attention because here's a 35-year-ish year old starting a new business, quit a very lucrative job on Wall Street to do this crazy idea of selling books on the internet. And he's already thinking about what he's he wants to tell his grandchildren that that was a first picture of what long-term thinking actually means to Jeff Bezos. And there are lots of other examples through the years. And I think you're right. And in, in, in he thinks that first letter is important enough that every single other letter always ends with, as is my custom, I'm attaching our 1997 letter. Huh. And so it, it is the linchpin, it is the foundation for what Bezos built Amazon into. And one of the things that I think was, was fun, Jeff, was as we were, as we were going through and seeing if, if we could extrapolate these 14 principles, um, after we got them, we kind of looked at each other and said, you know what would be fun? Let's go back to the 97 letter and see if all these principles are actually in that first letter. And we went through and highlighted the letter, and we found what we think are all 14 principles enumerated in, the, in that 97 letter. Yeah, it really is fascinating. I mean, I'm not one for idol worship, but like, the guy is kind of a badass. Smart. <laughs> smart. You yeah. know, I mean, really, like, and I think a couple things, you know, he's smart. There's no question his upbringing, his education. He's 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 just a very bright uh, person. I think long term thinking is a is a real key to that. He he thinks multi-generational um, and, you know, he is willing to buck the trends. He thinks differently. I mean, your comment about Wall Street, he actually says in that 97 letter, you know, we will focus on the long term. And if and he's addressing investors, and if that's not your investment philosophy, then we are not the right stock for you to buy. You know, so he's turning away investors when new, normally a new business would be trying to get more and more investors right. in. He when, wants when did, the right investors. When did he IPO? In um, May of 1995. No, excuse me, May of 1997. So the 97 shareholder letter came out in April of 98. He so, started in 95. I mean, that's just, that's just, you know, pretty, pretty suave and, and aggressive, pretty bold. Yeah. Yes. To be like, we're less than it. We're less than a year old on, on the, the block. And, you know, if you don't like what we're about, we don't want you. We don't want your money. Let me make another comment to sort of big picture. And um, that is, is that Bezos has always been interested and fascinated by space, space travel, anything about space. I think it was his, his high school valedictorian speech was about space. 
And I think that's an important variable to remember when you think about how he built Amazon, because he's always been been fascinated with exploring and, you know, going where no person used to be no man, going where no man has gone before. And, you know, all of those early Star Treks and all of that, that early space exploration. And I think that's really important for people to, to understand and think about is like he, he's really looking at how to, how to go to the edge, how to test the limits, how to go to beyond. And, and he, he takes calculated, we call them smart risks, Mm -hmm. calculated risks that, that, you know, Steve has talked about a lot. That's why it starts with testing. Like he tests ideas. Like you don't go into space without testing anything. And a lot of people will just go ahead and do something. They don't think of it in that that framework of testing. Because if you test something, you see whether it works or, or doesn't work. And you can see whether it's a good idea or not a good idea. But you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. And I think contextually, that's really important for entrepreneurs to remember. Um, so that they're, they're looking at, well, what did he do? He started an online bookstore. Well, it's a little bit more, there was a little bit more to it than that. It was, it was very strategic. It was very calculated. It was very smart. He was taking risks. But he was also on his hands and knees sticking books in boxes. So, yeah. So, so, okay. You, I, I appreciate the direction you just turned this uh, talking about entrepreneurs talking about his specific e-commerce model. I, I, I want to be, su- cause like I could go, I could get so ge- geeked out on this subject, but I want to be really cognizant of my audience. You know, a lot of my audience, they're listening to the millionaire secrets show because they're trying to figure out what's the secret to becoming a millionaire. I mean, I, I have to assume that's the appeal given the name and, 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 and a lot of them aren't millionaires yet, right? They don't have big budgets. They don't have a lot of the, maybe the runway that Jeff has to do these different things. And, and a lot of them, I mean, the single biggest question that I get from people is like, well, that's great. I want, the, I want this life. I, I hear you. Education maybe is not, it's, I don't want to say education's broken, but it's not all there is, the mainstream education system. What else can I do? What's the path look like? And so, you know, what I love about Jeff Bezos is, I mean, he practically invented e-commerce. I mean, you could say he didn't invent it, strictly speaking, but I, I remember one of his letters, he was like, look, e-commerce is, it exists, but it's terrible. So we're going to make it better. Okay. And so, uh, although he didn't invent it, I would say he invented it, he invented it in its, he invented good e-commerce. Maybe that's the way to say it. And so, so let me ask. So, something that everybody could use. Yeah, yeah. So let me ask you this. I have so many questions. My mind is a swirl. I've like never had access to people who know so much about Jeff Bezos. <laughs> um, why do you think he started with books? Oh, um, he made a list of 20 items that he thought could be uh, sold on the internet. So again, this is um, 94. He had done research for uh, the firm he was working for in New York uh, at, on the internet, and he saw this statistic that it was usage was increasing by 2,300% a year. You know, and that exponential kind of growth, he said, doesn't happen very often. And then he always wanted to start a business, and it was like, what kind of business could I start? So he made a list of 20 different items. Books rose to the top because books, one book is exactly the same as another book. So if you look at a Barnes and Noble and, and any store, a book is a book is a book. The limitation for physical stores was they could only carry 100,000 books and smaller stores, obviously less. An internet store could have unlimited shelf space. So you could have wide selection. And his goal, even from the very beginning, was low pricing. Now, fast delivery came in later, but... Books allowed, you know, was, there was no difference. And so selection became the key. If you wanted to find a book, that's why people came to Amazon originally, is either their local bookstore didn't have it, or even originally, they would actually go out and find uh, books for you uh, that were maybe out of print or things like that. They did a lot in that area. But you also could look at, very quickly they went into music and video. Right. Very similar characteristics, right? 
you could have unlimited shelf space. And remember, at the time, music and video were blockbuster tower records, right? You had to go to a physical store, which had limited inventory. He was not limited by physical space. So he could, essentially what he was doing was eliminating variables of competition. Nobody could beat you on quality. Nobody could beat you on differentiated packaging or anything. Right. They could only really compete around inventory and price. Right. Is that, am, am I reading you right? So you're saying that he identified that the, by going into those things, they're sort of like halfway in between commodity and not commodity. He only had to figure out two variables, which was inventory, which he, he won that battle out of the gate because he didn't have physical shelf space limitations. And then as Correct. he scaled, he knew that he'd be able to bring price down because he could amortize his cost. I remember learning this from him, he, that he knew that at a certain point, he'd be able to amortize his cost against a, across a greater number of units than anyone else. Therefore, right. his cost could, could beat them. Exactly. Yeah. Say too, you know, one of the things that we have here, uh, the, the second principle is called bet on big ideas. But I don't think that his big idea when he started out was selling books. His big idea, as you say, in terms of e-commerce, was looking at a way to leverage the infrastructure that was not being leveraged before that point. So one of the things Steve talks about is, you know, is really infrastructure. And when Bezos was launching Amazon, there, there were credit card, there was credit card processing. There was FedEx and UPS. I mean, those things had come before, but nobody had pulled them together and leveraged them in the same way that Bezos was doing. So, yeah, I mean, this, ugh, this is so, I'm, I'm like a kid in a candy store right now um, because I study this stuff all the time. I'm, 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 I'm an ambassador on a mission to try to take the possibility of the internet and translate it into real opportunity that the average person can seize right now. That's what my company Entra does. We say, look, there's a lot of crap online. There's a lot of gimmicks and a lot of scams, but frankly, there are very legitimate mainstream business models that anybody can plug into. And, and what I think we can learn, what I'm hearing from Jeff that I, you know, what he did in 1997 that I think we can still do today is say, if you want to enter into a new venture or a new market, it's important to eliminate at least some of the variables so that you can focus on control on controlling and dominating at a few for him it was about diversity of inventory and ultimately lowering cost he wasn't also having to compete on graphic design and artwork and packaging and you know all this other stuff for people now there's an entire industry where most of the variables are eliminated for you. And incidentally, Amazon is the single biggest player in this industry and it's called affiliate marketing. Right. Amazon has the biggest affiliate program in the world where essentially you can leverage Jeff having eliminated variables and then dominated the variables he wanted to compete on and then been able to reintroduce variables because he was so big and powerful. Now he dominates at everything. And you can leverage all that by becoming an affiliate of Amazon where you effectively eliminate every variable that Amazon themselves is dominating at. And the only variable that you're left with is basically the front end marketing. Right. If you can get people to a page or you can get people onto a list, you can get people into a funnel, you can get people to your blog, for example, or your YouTube channel, you can sell them Amazon products. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know, I hope my audience, you know, some of them may think, Oh, man, this conversation about, you know, Jeff Bezos's mind 25 years ago is kind of esoteric. But what we're talking about right now is something you can implement right now, no matter where you're at, no matter where you're starting, reducing the number of variables that you have to manage or compete on and isolating the few that you actually can develop the skill set to take control of, which I would suggest for most people now in the world we live in, Affiliate marketing just seems like this, this, you know, no brainer place to start. It's like, just learn a few skills, learn how to create some content, learn how to get people to the content and leverage Amazon. And, and frankly, for that matter, leverage Walmart and leverage Best Buy and leverage all these platforms that have, that they're already winning on all those other variables. Right. Well, and that, that whole idea, you know, affiliate and then marketplace, marketplace was a big bet. It was unknown. So me as a small business being able to go on Amazon's site and yeah. that also illustrates 
that encourage successful failure because Amazon tried two other uh, platforms to do that idea, but they the other two failed miserably. Uh, one was called, you know, what they tried to com compete with eBay. It was Amazon auctions. You know, okay. nobody wanted to come to Amazon for an auction. That was what eBay was for. And the other was Z shops, which required the customer to log into a different place on the Amazon site mm. to access those third party sellers. What the big bet was is to put those small businesses on exactly the same page where Amazon was selling their stuff right beside it. Why? Well, see, this goes back to, again, a core belief, a principle, which is obsess over customers. Bezos, to this day, believes 100% that if it's better for the customer, it, it will be better for Amazon and for Amazon shareholders. And so Marketplace was, if, if we don't have it or a third-party seller has it at a better price than we do, then the customer should be able to buy it. Now, they take a cut, right? That's sure. sort of the big idea. That's the brilliance. Yeah. But they, they built the infrastructure, the platform, the customers coming to their website that now m multiple thousands, millions of small businesses can access. And I will say this, those small businesses in Marketplace, if they don't understand Amazon's customer obsession, they don't treat Amazon's customers the way Amazon wants them treated, they will get cut out of that platform, you know, and there's been some grumblings about yeah. that, but if you don't understand the core mindset. That's probably not a platform you should be on. Yeah, I know. I know some people uh, and I've never played the game, so I don't have a personally founded opinion myself, but I know some people that have a lot of grumblings about mm -hmm. the FBA program. Yep. Because of exactly what you're saying. They've, they've either lost their entire accounts or they know people who have, and it's, you know, one, I know that one of Jeff Bezos's letters was, if I'm remembering right, was entirely about having high standards. Yes. He wrote a whole letter about just high standards, right? Which I think is amazing because I think that well, that's sorely lacking in the world. Right. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and we talk about that in the scale section. So one of the principles is focus on high standards and the other is maintain your culture. Kind of go hand in hand there. Man, those are music to my ears in my company. I, uh, I just got off the phone with a guy who's a sales recruiter. We're, we're expanding our sales team. And I was like, listen, man, you got to like, I, this is not just lip service. I don't just want people that are good salespeople. I want people that get up early in the morning. I want people that go to the gym. I want people that eat right. I want people that are good. You know, you would feel comfortable babysitting your kids. I want feel pe people that, you know, are articulate. I want people that are loyal to their husbands or wives. I want like all this qualitative stuff. And I'm like, because that's our culture. And if they come here, they're either going and they're not like that. They're either going to have to hide, right? Or they're or they're going to show their true colors, and and it's going to contaminate what we're doing. And like, I I um I mean, it's crazy that he's able to maintain that. And he get you know, I know he gets some grief, and I'm curious you guys have thought of this to say Amazon's almost like an abusive culture. But my word, for a company that big, it seems like he actually holds standards pretty well. He, oh, he does. And, and I, I, again, I'm astounded by, you know, a company growing to uh, over 800,000 employees and maintain their, their inventive culture uh, and their, uh, their high standards. And, and what's interesting to me is absolutely, I would say it, what I've read and I've read extensively interviews from former employees, interviews and it is a hard place to work. They all acknowledge that. And there is, seems to always be this sense of, and they were, it were some of the best people I worked with, I've ever worked with, right? Because A players want to work with A players. Yeah. A players don't want to work with B players. And that's sort of what you're talking about in terms of salesmen who can just sell. No, they need to be high quality, high standard people. It isn't his number one. I remember another letter and I'll, I'll confess that I'm, I'm not like just a savant with his letters. I did a little bit of review before I met with you guys. and like, yeah, let me go back and review the letters. But I remember one of them was about who he hires and the criteria for good hiring. And it was like the number one rule, it had nothing to do with competence for the 
the, the role description. It had nothing to do with previous experience. It was like, is this an admirable person? Correct. So that was in the 1998 letter. Oh, it's so beautiful. And he talks about the, the three questions, you know, that he asks, that he wants asked of a new, new candidate. And one of them is, will they raise the average level of competence in the group they're entering? The other is, mm -hmm. will you admire this person? Right? It's just what you said. And the third is, on what other dimension might they be a superstar? Meaning, kind of non technical, non work. And the example he gives is uh, uh, an employee at the time in 98 who was a national spelling bee champion as somebody who brings something different, right, to the culture that he's building there. Oh, so cool. So cool. And, 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 uh, you know, I'm, I'm, again, I'm in the, with my business, I'm scaling a company. I would say your four stages were, were test, build, accelerate and scale. And I'm actually, I'd like to run this by you and say, where do you think my company fits? Cause it, it's as handy an example as any to say, let's flesh these out. So I have a company that I kind of rebooted fall 2018 um, spent and you know we're in a new paradigm now so it's all about content and influence and social marketing and all that so I spent the better part of a year just putting out a ton of social content building a foundation of goodwill and you know what they call value just giving 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 like like Bezos says if it's good for the customer in the long run it'll be good for the company from my point of view it was like if I give value to my future customers even though right now it's a whole lot of work and frankly it's costing me money eventually it'll build a foundation, right? So I did that for a year from 2018 to 2019. Summer 2019, we started selling. We spent about eight months in what's clearly was the test phase. Uh, I would actually, that, okay, so first question, was it the test phase or was it the build phase? Because the first year I was putting all this content out and all I was doing was looking to see which pieces of content got the most engagement. Mm -hmm. because that would tell me what's my audience interested in. Yep. Yeah, so definitely. That, is, you're testing, again, what content resonates, where that, that's all part of testing. Okay. Um, and, you know, a key idea in the testing area is uh, what the principle we call practice dynamic invention and innovation. Um, and, and, again, I'll treat, keep it brief, but I think all the focus now on innovation is wrong. Because what, we don't need more innovation. We need more experimentation. Experimentation leads to innovation, right? Because you experiment what works, what doesn't work. We got, you know, lots of examples from Thomas Edison on, right? All were around experimentation, which leads to innovation. Again, that's what Amazon does. In fact, I, they, one of their Echo products, Echo Show Live came out. It took a picture of you and then analyzed your outfits to give you suggestions on what else to wear. That's closing in July in a few weeks. Then it's no longer going to be available. That was an experiment for Amazon, and they are absolutely willing to test. And if it doesn't work out the way they want it, close it, cancel it, get rid of it, or bet more on it if it does work out the way they want and it's, and the echo you know so they're i consider i would say perhaps their biggest failure is their fire phone so most people don't realize amazon actually released a phone in 2014 uh to great fanfare jeff bezos personal pet project he wanted a phone nobody else wanted a phone at one point they tried to sell it for 99 cents and they couldn't give it away. And they wrote off $178 million in development and inventory costs at the end of in the last quarter of 2014. However, failure, where's the success? Four months after the Fire Phone was announced, Bezos got his first demonstration of a device that you could talk to and it would answer. Echo hardware. Alexa machine learning. They took what they learned of voice processing and how to do that and 
I, I think we can agree that Echo seems to be a pretty successful product right now. So that that grew out of the phone. Yes. Yeah. That failed. That failed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it well, makes for you. Back to you. So you're testing what what content resonates, what doesn't. You have uh, metrics around that. How many likes? Whatever those right. metrics that you looked at, and then what did you do? Based on the success, you've developed more content in that area because that seemed to resonate. Yeah, and I actually yeah. created my first training course by taking what I knew people wanted, which is like, well, how do I start a business on the internet? But frankly, those courses are a dime a dozen. Right. What I found through my testing is that people really resonated when I talked about my kids, talked about struggles in parenting, when I talked about marriage, when I talked about fitness. And so what I did was I rolled out a course that wasn't just here's how you build a business online. It was here's how you use an online business to become the engine of a life where you have more flexibility, more freedom, and more disposable income to invest in these other qualitative aspects of life that are the true quality of life metrics, like more time with your family, you know, going to therapy to figure crap out with your wife or husband, you know, uh, getting up in the morning and hiring a trainer, being able to shop at Whole Foods where the food's more expensive so you can finally cure your cholesterol issues. Like, and I anchored it all to that. And, and, and then, and so then I guess my question would be, so if testing was the content and then I found where the traction hooks were, then I built this course and then I had to figure out and optimize and tweak the funnel. By the way, mm -hmm. shameless plug, the course is called the Entre Blueprint. And if you're listening to Millionaire Secrets, it's available on like it online at millionaireshortcut.com. Download the free ebook today. <laughs> um, oh, <laughs> thank way you. Way to thank go. You. So, I so then I tested it or then I, I would say I built the course nine months we tested the or we I would say we optimized the funnel and got it having built it I think what's coming is accelerate because yep. once we knew we could sell it profitably based on certain KPIs in the funnel and the cost of online ads in the last five months we've grown our entire business 750 percent mm -hmm. because it's like so you're building hey this works let's pour gas on it right yeah and that's the accelerate and that's and so. Accelerate. What's the difference between accelerate and scale? I mean, say what you're going to say, but then that's my question. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll answer your question. So you know, accelerate is okay. How how do we take this and and even make it better? So again, a couple of the principles: high velocity decision making, mm -hmm. uh, make, make complexity simple, um, accelerate time with technology. So really, accelerate is all about how can you tweak that product. How can you improve that product? How can you make something, the, the, the customer experience even better in that product? And oh, by the way, you should be thinking about what else you're going to be testing. You see, the, it, the issue here is you, you, you're not just in going through these, but another product you could be thinking about and testing and starting to build now right. as this one is accelerating to the point you know, and then scaling, you know, is what happens when you have 50 employees? So we're up, to, we're up to about 35. So it sounds yeah, like I need so to be thinking that way. I think you need, you know, how do you maintain your culture? Hmm. You know, and again, your conversation about hiring sales is part of that process. What else can you do to maintain your cu culture? How can you focus on high standards and not compromise because you have to have a body and a position? So that if I'm hearing, me. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. It's okay. If I'm hearing you right, this test, build, accelerate, scale, there's sort of, it's sort of like cascading iterations where you, you do one thing, test, build, maybe you're accelerating, but really as soon as capital and resources permit, be testing and building behind it the next thing. And it like almost unfolds like waves. Is that, yes. and, and as I'm saying that out loud, I'm like, wait, hey, that's, clear, that's how Jeff Bezos built his company. I was going to say, I was right. just going to say, does Bezos sit back and say, man, I've made it? Or right. is he continuing to build new things? He and right, the team that he's built. And then back to what Karen said earlier, let's add in Blue Origin and space and write right. all of these, again, big ideas and long-term thinking. And he's always looking at how to test, build, accelerate. 
So the 14 principles, if I'm understanding right, they all fit within one of those four categories. Correct. Correct. Okay. And, and I don't want to make you say them all right now because unless I stopped to take notes, I wouldn't remember them all. Um, but these are all spelled out. Obviously, everyone buy the book. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but is there, a, is there a Cliff's Notes place where, I mean, literally for me, I want to like, as soon as we get off, I want to go like write these down. Yeah. So um, uh, the website is thebezosletters.com. And we actually end the book oh. and have available as a PDF download you know, this graphic that we put together that has all the principles and the cycles on it. And, you know, all the arrows really, tr we try to reinforce the fact that every business, every product, every department goes through these cycles and not all at the same time mm -hmm. or in the same place. Right. And once you get through, you may, like I just suggested, what's your next course or mm -hmm. what's your next product or what's your next, you start, and continue that process as you go through. So there's a, a downloadable PDF uh, printout of this on thebezosletters.com. Is there a certain, because again, I know that many people in my audience are uh, either maybe young, Im, call them immature business owners or not even yet business owners that are, a lot of people have a job and they're like, man, I, I want to get off the hamster side wheel, I should or, start yeah. a side hustle or something, right? Is there a point where you think people need to start implementing and embracing these principles or is it like, this is foundation, start, start now? Um, I would say a couple of things. One is uh, they could bring it into their own wherever they are now. You know, I get asked, how do, how do you bring this into an existing business? <laughs> and I'll absolutely acknowledge that can be really hard because you're, you're fighting against um, a mindset that is not growth oriented and in experiment in, uh, oriented, et cetera. And, and that's why the last principle is believe it's always day one. And that really kind of encapsulates mm. how Bezos thinks. And in my opinion, why Amazon continues to be one of the most inventive and innovative companies out there because they are constantly looking at how to do it better. And what's day one? Um, the, the way, actually, so I have to say, the way I like to answer you know, day one, and it's a mindset, right? But it's this idea of what was it like the first day you started your business? You, you know, whatever you define as that first day. It was excitement, it was, I gotta take care of the customers, it was fear, it was, right, all kinds of things. Exhilaration to, to be starting. But in the 2016 letter, Jeff addresses it really directly because he's asked at an all hands meeting, what does day two look like? Um, and, and I'm gonna read out of the 2016 letter just to make sure I get it right. Um, day two is stasis, followed by irrelevance, followed by excruciating painful decline, followed by death. And that's why it's always day one. So I would say, you know, okay, what is a day two company? Blockbuster. Mm -hmm. IBM, maybe. Microsoft was until about five years ago. And they have made this, I'm really watching them closely. They have made this really interesting transformation, perhaps back to an inventive and inventive company. Um, but, and he goes on to say, he talks a lot about it. Okay, you know, day two, what does it mean? And, and he, he discusses what he calls a starter pack of day two defense, me, me, uh, day one defense, meaning how do we prevent a day two mindset from creeping in? And here's what he says. Customer obsession, a skeptical view of proxies. Now, for Bezos, that means processes and procedures that don't have customer first focus, right? So how many times have you heard a customer service person say, oh, our procedures don't allow that. Oh, I can't do that. Oh, I don't have the authority. Oh, I, right, all of that. Those are proxies. Three, um, the eager adoption of external trends. Uh, and to me, that's so important in today's world, right? Yeah. And he, he goes on to use machine learning as an external trend. And again, lots of 
comments about what they're doing to eagerly adopt that trend. And fourth is high velocity decision making, meaning you make decisions with at most 70% of the information you wish you had, and you don't wait. And he, again, calls them type one and type two decisions. Type one are tough, irreversible, big decisions. You make those slowly with lots of information. Type two decisions are easily reversible. And he says the problem in a day two company is they start moving type two decisions to a type one process. Can you think of organizations, larger ones, that have like multi layers of approval to get something done? That's a day two company. Yeah, that, I mean, that takes me back to my early days as an entrepreneur when I was trying to sell, you know, progressive things, marketing innovations that just they couldn't get approved up the flagpole, you know, just even though everybody knew it was a, it was a good, good idea. It was an, it was an, in, the thing is there was no risk because it was only going to increase efficiency, even if it didn't work beyond that. But it's not how we do things here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I, I remember that. So That's all indicators of day two mindset. Um, yeah, this is, oh, this is so good. So I, I, we're out of time. I literally, my goodness. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, I'm going to read the book. So that's an easy, easy next step for me. How can people come and enter you guys' world? You know, whether it's this book, is there something else you want to share with people? Where would you send people that want to know more? So more about the book is the website is probably the best entry point is thebezosletters.com. Uh, it's available uh, wherever you buy books. Um, so it's on Amazon, I would presume. It is on Amazon, <laughs> absolutely. With honest reviews. And we love honest reviews, yeah. Um, and it uh, has been translated into eight languages, and uh, another about four languages are coming here in the next few months. Uh, so internationally, it's, it's had a, a, a surprising to me, uh, it, it's had an amazing impact. Um, Connect with me socially, probably LinkedIn is the best place for me. And um, I will say that I just, uh, last couple weeks, I started a LinkedIn newsletter. It's a new service that LinkedIn is offering uh, called Risk or, um, uh, Return on Risk. Uh, and if you go to my profile, you should be able to see a link to uh, subscribe there. So every week I'll have uh, an issue of the newsletter uh, talking about, again, a concept I explore in the book uh, called Return on Risk. You know, are you taking too much risk or not enough? <sighs> I, well, I'm gonna, I'll be, uh, I'll, I'll be hitting you up on LinkedIn and I'll, I'll I'm, like I said, um, I'm going to read the book, <laughs> but, uh, and, and actually I pulled up the website and yeah, I see you've got a lot of it spelled out here. I actually see you have, uh, Sonny Leonard Dutzi as a testimonial on the site. Yes. She's, she's a big YouTube, uh, influencer on, on how to scale a YouTube channel. I'm actually in her, in her group, her Facebook group. Well, she was uh, on vacation on a beach in Mexico and uh, was reading the book and somebody we know was there, saw her reading it and made an introduction. So <laughs> I did a podcast cool. with her also. Yeah, she's a, she's a great marketer. Um, well, guys, I have enjoyed this so much. Uh, congratulations on writing Thank you. A, a popular book. It's cool to sell a lot of copies, but I mean, just a fantastic project that produced a fantastic result. Um, congrats on all your success. I, uh, I will make sure we get all those links from you. Our team will reach out and we'll get the you know, links to populate under the, the recording and direct people the way you want them to go. Um, yeah, this has just been a lot of fun, guys. I appreciate you coming on Millionaire Secrets. Yeah, and it, it, we don't do many of these together. So it was uh, uh, fun and different for us too. So thank you for having us. Of course, us. yeah, you guys have an awesome dynamic. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you for watching Millionaire Secrets. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and leave us a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you know whenever we release a new episode. Also, if you wanna learn the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy, click the link in the description below to claim your free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut. And don't forget, Millionaire Secrets is available on all the major podcast platforms as well. 
Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you can listen on the go. Thanks for watching.